67 million years after they died locked in combat, two dinosaurs, one a predator experts claimed couldn't exist, have surfaced as North Carolina's dueling dinosaurs. For decades, science called the smaller skeleton a juvenile T-Rex, until forensic bone analysis exposed adult growth rings and deadly matching bite marks. If this fossil proves Nanotyrannus killed its prey, every textbook on T-Rex could be wrong. What did researchers find buried in that $31 million block? And why has it launched the fiercest debate in paleontology? On a windswept ranch in Montana's Hell Creek Formation, a fossil hunter's pick struck stone and revealed something no one expected. Two dinosaur skeletons tangled together, bone against bone. Field notes from that day in 2006 read like dispatches from a crime scene. Overlapping ribs, a curved jaw pressed against a bony frill, teeth embedded in crest. The dig team stared in disbelief as more bones surfaced, each fragment confirming the impossible. These weren't scattered remains. The skeletons were complete, locked in contact, preserved in a single block of sandstone that would eventually weigh more than 14 tons. Photographs snapped in the dust captured faces frozen between awe and dread. The excitement of finding a combat fossil, something so rare that most paleontologists never see one in a lifetime, quickly collided with the reality of what it would take to extract them. The bones twisted through the rock in three dimensions. Ribs from one animal curled under the limbs of the other. The sandstone itself was dense and unyielding, threatening to crack under its own weight if handled carelessly. Every move had to be documented. Crew members logged the position of every exposed bone and injury. A freshly fractured femur, what looked like a bite wound across the frill. The team realized immediately that they were looking at a prehistoric struggle frozen in time a predator and prey locked at the moment of death. The fossil's completeness and the violence of its preservation set it apart from anything in the field notes of the past century. But as the adrenaline faded, a new problem took hold. The entire specimen, both dinosaurs entwined, would have to be removed as a single block. That meant heavy machinery, delicate plastering, and a race against the elements. Even before the legal battles began, the fossil hunters knew this discovery would test every skill they had, and that the world would soon be watching. Court filings piled up almost as quickly as the sandstone around the fossil block. In 2008, a lawsuit over mineral rights froze the dueling dinosaurs in legal limbo. The Murray family, who owned the Montana ranch, argued fossils were not minerals and should remain their property. BEJ Minerals, holding the mineral rights, saw things differently. The question, are fossils minerals or something else entirely, dragged through the federal district court, then the Ninth Circuit, and finally up to the Supreme Court. For nearly 12 years, the fossil sat untouched, boxed in plaster and paperwork, its secrets locked away from science. During the legal deadlock, the fossil's value climbed. By the time the court sided with the Murray family in 2020, the dueling dinosaurs had become the most coveted unstudied specimen in paleontology. The North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences stepped in with a $31 million offer, a record-breaking sum that drew headlines and scrutiny. Behind closed doors, museum board members debated the risks and rewards. Some questioned the use of public funds, while private donors and biotech executives pledged support in exchange for naming rights and early research access. State legislators pushed for promises of tourism and educational impact to justify the investment. Once the deal closed, logistics took over. Specialized teams coordinated the fossil's transport across state lines, with security and climate controls in place for the 14-ton cargo. In 2020, the fossil arrived at the North Carolina Museum's SECU Dino Lab, still partially encased in its original rock. For the first time, the public could glimpse the intertwined skeletons through glass. But even as crowds gathered, the real work was just beginning. Years of research and preparation lay ahead, with the museum's scientists finally able to probe the fossil's mysteries. The dueling dinosaurs had survived the courts. Now it was time for science to have its say. In the autumn of 1942, 
a battered skull surfaced from the Badlands near Lance Creek in Wyoming. Charles Gilmore, working for the Smithsonian, examined the specimen, cataloged as CMNH-7541, and published a brief description in the annals of the Carnegie Museum. The skull was small, just over half a meter long, with a slender snout and more teeth than any known Tyrannosaurid. Gilmore named it Gorgosaurus lancensis, but the details faded into obscurity as World War II overshadowed paleontology. Decades later, in 1988, the fossil was re-examined by Robert Backer and colleagues. Armed with sharper tools and new theories, Backer saw not a juvenile but a new predator, smaller, faster, and distinct. He published the name Nanotyrannus lancensis, the tiny tyrant of the late Cretaceous. The announcement landed like a thunderclap at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. Backer argued that the skull's proportions, tooth count, and slender jaws set it apart from the hulking Tyrannosaurus rex. He pointed to the fused bones and mature features, declaring this was no child, but a fully grown killer. Skeptics pushed back. Jack Horner and Thomas Carr, rising stars in the field, challenged Backer's interpretation. They argued the small skull was simply a teenage T-Rex, caught mid-growth. They cited growth series in other dinosaurs, where juveniles looked nothing like adults. The debate spilled from journals into conference hallways, with heated exchanges over bone structure, tooth patterns, and the meaning of maturity in dinosaurs. Peer reviewers demanded more evidence, and museum curators quietly sided with the majority. Without a complete skeleton, Nanotyrannus would remain a controversial footnote, yet the name stuck, and the idea of a second Tyrannosaur lurking in the shadows of T-Rex haunted the field. For every new fragment discovered, researchers asked, was this a young king or a rival predator lost to time? The original skull, CMNH-7541, became a touchstone for the argument, a single fossil at the center of a scientific storm. Inside museum backrooms and conference halls, the Nanotyrannus debate became a scientific battleground. On one side, Robert Backer and his allies pressed their case with every new fossil fragment, arguing for a distinct predator that science had overlooked. On the other, Jack Horner and Thomas Carr fired back with growth curves and developmental models, insisting that every so-called Nanotyrannus was just a young T-Rex in disguise. The arguments weren't just academic. For decades, curators at institutions like the Field Museum in Carnegie quietly relabeled specimens, following the dominant theory that no mature Nanotyrannus had ever been found. Growth charts in textbooks and museum displays used nanobones to plot T. Rex's life story, from hatchling to king. Peer-reviewed papers built entire behavioral models on this foundation, and graduate students staked careers on ontogenetic series that blended two species into one. The stakes kept rising. If the juvenile T-Rex theory collapsed, it would mean that growth rates, feeding strategies, even the number of apex predators in the Hell Creek ecosystem had been miscounted for a generation. At paleontology conferences, heated exchanges spilled into the hallways. Backer, never shy, declared in a 2015 session, science demands the truth, even if it's heresy. Horner shot back, it's all growth curves and wishful thinking. Carr's internal memos, later leaked, warned, no mature individual yet, no firm case without a complete skeleton. Behind the scenes, pressure mounted on curators to conform. Emails from 2012 reveal museum directors debating whether to keep the nano label on display or quietly switch to T-Rex juvenile, just to avoid controversy. Some researchers, sensing the tide, published papers that hedged their bets, listing specimens as as Tyrannosaurus, juvenile, or Nanotyrannus slash T-Rex indeterminate. The entire field braced for a reckoning. What if the foundation for T-Rex's growth and behavior was built on the bones of a completely different animal? The only way out was evidence, something complete, something irrefutable, something that could settle the war once and for all. In the quiet of the SECU Dino Lab, the real test began with a diamond-edged saw and a fragment of fossilized bone. Lindsay Zano and her team selected a section from the Tyrannosaurus femur knowing that what they found inside could settle a scientific war. The process was exacting. The bone was embedded in resin, sliced wafer-thin, and mounted onto glass slides. 
Under the microscope, the cross-section revealed a series of concentric rings, lines of arrested growth, or LAGs, each one the mark of a year survived. The count was unambiguous, 20 distinct rings, each spaced by bands of dense bone circling inward toward the marrow cavity. At the outer edge of the cortex, the rings grew closer and closer together, forming a tightly packed band known as the external fundamental system. This feature is the gold standard for adulthood in dinosaurs. It signals that the animal's growth had plateaued, that the rapid expansion of youth was over, and that bone deposition had slowed to a crawl. For the dueling dinosaurs Tyrannosaur, the presence of an EFS, clear, continuous, and unmistakable, meant the animal was fully mature when it died. In every section, the story repeated itself. The tibia, sampled near the mid-shaft, showed the same sequence, 20 LAGs, a pronounced EFS, and patches of remodeled bone, secondary osteons, typical of mature individuals. Even the rib, less ideal for age estimation, preserved enough structure to confirm the pattern. The team checked for diagenetic overprinting, scanning for mineral infill or erosion that might obscure the record, but the growth lines held firm under scrutiny. Zano's lab notes captured the moment. Count 20. No ambiguity. EFS present. This is adulthood. The evidence was overwhelming. The dueling dinosaur's tyrannosaur was not a teenager caught mid-growth. It was a 20-year-old predator, growth complete, its skeleton locked in the final chapter of its life. The histology left no room for doubt. The specimen's bones had recorded a lifetime, ring by ring, and the verdict was written in stone. The dueling dinosaur's tyrannosaur stands apart from every juvenile T-Rex ever unearthed, not just by age, but by anatomy. Its skull holds more teeth than any T-Rex at any stage of life, 14 in the lower jaw, 13 in the upper. Tooth sockets line up with a precision that matches the punctures gouged into the Triceratops frill. The bite marks are not random. Their spacing and depth mirror the predator's own jaw, each wound a physical signature left during the final struggle. The arms tell the same story. Where T-Rex forelimbs shrink and weaken with age, these are long and muscular, designed for grasping, not vestigial at all. The ratio of limb length to body size is fixed early in development and never matches that of even the youngest T-Rex. This is not the anatomy of a growing king, but a specialized hunter, fully mature and built for speed and precision. Every vertebra in the spine is fused, locking the skeleton into the posture of an adult. The tail is shorter than in T-Rex, another trait set before birth and unchanging as the animal aged. The nerve canals in the skull branch in a pattern distinct from any Tyrannosaurid except Nanotyrannus itself. These features, teeth, limbs, vertebrae, cranial nerves, are not the temporary traits of youth. They are the permanent stamp of a separate species. The wounds on the triceratops, the embedded teeth, the matched bite arcs, they seal the verdict. This was not a scavenger or an opportunist. The predator that left those marks was the same animal now locked in stone beside its prey. Anatomy and injury converge on one conclusion. Nanotyrannus killed its prey, and the fossil preserves the act itself. The case is closed by the bones, not by theory. 18 feet from snout to tail, the dueling dinosaur's Nanotyrannus stands as a predator built for pursuit. Its body was lean, not the barrel-chested mass of a T-Rex, but a streamlined frame with long, sinewy legs. The femur and tibia stretch in near-perfect proportion for speed, their ratios more like a sprinter's than a heavyweight's. Each limb ends in three raptorial claws, longer and more flexible than those of its giant cousin, suggesting a grip made for holding on, not just slashing. The backbone, fused and rigid, supports a tail that's shorter and stiffer than T-Rex, acting as a dynamic counterbalance during high-speed chases. Measured from the base of the skull to the tip of the tail, the skeleton reads like a blueprint for agility. The forelimbs, nearly as long as the thigh bones, retain full muscle attachment scars, evidence of powerful grasping ability. Rib spacing and chest cavity dimensions hint at a deep lung volume, fuel for sustained bursts of activity. Morphometric analysis confirms this animal was no lumbering brute. 
Every bone, every joint, points to a predator evolved for acceleration and rapid maneuvering. In the world of late Cretaceous predators, Nanotyrannus was the specialist, the anatomical opposite of T-Rex, designed to chase, seize, and overpower swift prey. Late Cretaceous Montana was no one dinosaur show. With Nanotyrannus confirmed as a mature predator, the food web comes into sharper focus. T-Rex, at 40 feet and 7 tons, dominated the landscape as a heavyweight ambush hunter, built for bone-crushing bites and brute force. But Nanotyrannus, at just 18 feet and a fraction of the mass, filled a different role. Its long legs and deep chest cavity hint at an animal designed for speed, not power. Prey profiles from Hell Creek reveal a spectrum of mid-sized dinosaurs, ornithomimids, small ceratopsians, and juvenile hadrosaurs, too quick or agile for T-Rex to catch reliably. Nanotyrannus, with its grasping forelimbs and flexible claws, was perfectly adapted to pursue these targets. No bone beds or trackways have yet confirmed pack behavior, but the anatomical evidence suggests a predator suited to rapid chases and sudden strikes. The presence of two apex tyrannosaurs in the same ecosystem wasn't a fluke. Niche partitioning, one giant, one sprinter, meant direct competition was rare. Instead, each species carved out its own hunting grounds, its own prey, its own strategy for survival. The Hell Creek ecosystem, once thought simple and dominated by a single king, now emerges as a complex web of rivalry and adaptation. In 2006, two dinosaurs, an adult Triceratops and an 18-foot Nanotyrannus, were unearthed together in Montana, preserved in a single sandstone block. After 14 years of legal battles, the specimen arrived at the North Carolina Museum in 2020. Bone histology revealed that the Tyrannosaur was nearly 20 years old, with growth rings and fused bones proving it was a mature individual, not a juvenile T-Rex. Forensic analysis matched tooth punctures on the Triceratops frill to the Nanotyrannus dentition, providing the first direct fossil evidence of predation. This overturned decades of research built on the assumption that Nanotyrannus was just a young T-Rex. Yet, open questions remain. The precise cause of death and the full extent of preserved soft tissue are still under investigation. Museums worldwide must now re-examine their collections. The dueling dinosaur's fossil stands as the most complete record of predatory behavior from the late Cretaceous, and as the definitive proof that a second apex predator once stalked the same ground as T. rex.